All right. Good morning. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to do this in French. Uh, That's not going to work well. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a, a bit of a different session from what I'm usually doing. For those who have been at um, the conference last year, I think it was a very hands-on kind of approach to uh, log files and migration. So this year it's going to be a bit different. Um, nevertheless, I hope um, you find it. Um, interesting and also useful. I'm happy to share the slides afterwards. So just uh, drop me a quick email and then um, we can send them out. There's a bunch of data in there that might be um, worth following up with. All right, that said, um, so one of my frustrations, uh, I think, if you so will, and also one of the bigger problems that I see in SEO really, is that there is a lot of misinformation out there. And misinformation is the one thing, but also it is this kind of like people going and saying like, well, I have heard X, Y, that um, someone telling someone else something, but they were really not into the conversation. So that means they were kind of missing context or they were missing kind of this, the deeper understanding. And then what happens oftentimes, obviously, when you're not really fully part of a conversation, you take one thing for granted, um, but it would not really necessarily fit with what you are trying to do. Also, then there's this uh, tiny search engine uh, out there that uh, actually, to be fair, I think Google got way better in communicating things over the last years, and they're putting quite a lot of effort into this, so that's really good. But oftentimes, it still happens that, I mean, tweets only leave room for so much information, right? Um, and then they're taken out of context again, and then you know someone takes that for granted again, and it doesn't really, it doesn't really work. Or it's really cryptic, and you're like, yeah, what does that now mean, right? So, um, which led me to the point where I became really frustrated, as I said, and thought we should maybe really spend more time, and not only us, but probably everyone, um, spending more time on, on really testing things and trying to understand things and break things potentially, rather than just taking everything for granted, right? Um, so we built this um, test lab playground, however you want to call it, and it's, it's actually nothing too crazy. It's just basically... Um, a CMS where you can set up different test cases and scenarios, and it brings a lot of kind of embedded functionality with it. I'm going to walk you quickly through it, and I'm also happy to share uh, the code base if you if you want it. So <laughs> I asked my developers to build like uh, how does it work, and I got this. Um, I didn't understand anything, um, so <laughs> that was a bit of a shame. So um, yeah, let's just skip the slide. Basically, what it is, it is a tidy, it is a, a, a mini CMS where you can spin up um, HTML documents. We can add elements to the hat, to the body, to the footer, um, that can be JavaScript, that can be anything else. Um, it brings in integrated um, bot tracking based on JavaScript feature detection. It writes automatically log files. Kasper mentioned it earlier. Um, you can spin um, content, unique content in various languages, depending on kind of what market you want to test for, et cetera, et cetera. So a whole bunch of things. The reason why we built this framework is that obviously not every SEO is necessarily um, a developer, right? So, but still, I want my team to be able to set up tests um, without having the, the deep, deep, deep development knowledge. But they, when they understand the tech SEO concepts, I want them to be able to test that. So, yeah, this is how it looks like. It's a simple HTML. Um, for those that are familiar with HTML, I'm quite sure you figured it out. Um, in this case, there's some JavaScript that has been added to the hat. Uh, there is some debugging info. There's unique content that has been spun. And then there is this bot tracking that comes with it. So this is pretty much it. And then this is available by default for all the tests that you can set up. I will say, though, and I think this is important, um, context, I mentioned already earlier, context matters. Um, there's a couple of things that you should keep in mind. Uh, I think one thing is obviously that um, those results will be different if you're testing on, say, like an old established domain because it has authority, it has a link profile, whatever metric you want to apply, versus something that's brand new. So results might be different. Also, um, Martin mentioned that earlier, um, domains that already are switched to mobile-first indexing, they might react differently to tests than domains that, some, that somewhat have has not have not been switched over yet, so those results can be different. Um, I would point it out if that's the case. Also, and I have to say that as well, I guess is isolated SEO testing is impossible. Um, there will always be factors in play that you can't influence. There will always be factors in play that you can't see. You know, so potentially someone could ruin your test from the outside if they would be pointing a link to it or whatever. Keep it in mind. Don't say. Uh, don't take for granted what I say. Please retest. That's important. 
draw your own conclusions, but I think everything is better than just taking what someone says for granted. Test it yourself. I think this is very important, right? So, that said, um, enough of the housekeeping. Um, I brought seven different kind of areas, I'd say, uh, of things that we looked at. And the first I want to start with is indexing. So we looked at a bit of the behavior of uh, robots meta tags, and also you can do indexing directives using server headers, right? So xrobots headers would allow you to set indexing rules as well. Um, so the, the first thing, um, we're going to try some, uh, and this is going to be especially hard now because it's uh, English and French, so we shall see how that goes. We try a bit of audience participation. Um, is there anyone that has an idea, and the first row is excluded, you guys are cheating. Um, is there anyone that has an idea what, if there's anything wrong with this? Yeah, shout if you know if, there, if there's anything wrong with this. What is wrong? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. That should be content, so that the proper um, the proper tag annotation would look like this, right? So if you look at the W3 specifications and the standard, um, it should look like this. Um, funnily enough, though, um, when you test it with the wrong annotation in Search Console, um, Google actually understands it, even though um, that shouldn't be the case. And, they, and now you're like, why does he even test this nonsense, I assume? So I had a client that had a website, um, and all the URLs had this. And I saw it, and I was like, well, this shouldn't matter, because at the end of the day, it should be indexed, right? But I couldn't get it into the index. So essentially, um, Google does some kind of auto-correction or whatever. In this case, they at least understand uh, and take this. So I found that quite interesting. Then I kind of got creative. I was like, well, what if um, I would be combining the, the, the two ones, so the, the wrong one and the right one? Um, so in this case, they would be taking content uh, over value instead. Um, and then I kind of also mixed order, but it doesn't also make a difference. So I guess, uh, long, short, long story very short, if content is present, uh, it's going to be content, um, but value also seemed to work. There's another one um, that I found interesting. So um, for those that pay a bit of attention, you probably spot that this should not be robot, but robots um, instead. So there's a typo in there. It should look like this. Um, funnily enough, in this case, um, robot also does seem to work. So uh, again, please watch what uh, you have in, in, in those annotations. Um, it's not as straightforward sometimes as it seems to be. Third one, um, and this I found also quite interesting. Um, so in this case, we have a double annotation, right? So robots um, being no index, so that should be true for all crawlers. And then there's a more precise user agent or more, more precise crawl annotation um, that's set to Googlebot um, being indexed. And this behavior is actually, it hasn't changed over the years. So this works as expected. Um, it works in a way that Google would take the um, index, which is, which is what the documentation says. So that's, that's great. Um, that's fair enough. However, um, there is an interesting behavior when you add server headers uh, to this entire mix. So server headers, just to kind of um, give you a bit of context, this would look like this. So this is the same URL. Um, on the left-hand side, you would see that there is an X robots uh, that's set to no index. And on the right-hand side, you have the same annotations as before, right? So the no index for the uh, broad user agent and the, the, the index for the specific user agent. My understanding would have been in the past that um, since the more precise uh, user agent on the right-hand side is still there, that they would actually um, still allow it for indexing. Um, turns out they don't. So whenever you have a no index in the header, um, it doesn't really matter if you have a more precise user agent um, that wins um, in HTML, if that makes any sense. So that was really unexpected for me um, because normally I would have thought um, that the, the, the more precise um, one wins. That does not seem to be the case. It seems to be the case that whenever you have a no index set in the, head, uh, in the header, sorry, um, then they just stop processing the rest of it, or at least not taking the um, indexing director further. All right, and that's a whole bunch of other tests. Again, as I said, I'm happy to share, so if you want to um, poke around and try uh, what other funny things they're doing, um, yeah. There's another thing um, following up on this. So as you see, there's a whole bunch of like screenshots from uh, Search Console in there. Um, and there's another thing that I noticed, and I just want to clarify, because I didn't see it instantly, and I was really confused. On the left-hand side, you see um, um, basically a JavaScript that is 
setting a specific page to no index, right? So this is relatively straightforward, and, and as expected, um, as we all know, Google is rendering. Um, so on the right-hand side, you would see they understand the no index, right? So straightforward, no, no crazy things going on there. What um, caught my attention, though, was that it says crawled as Googlebot desktop. And I was like, hmm, why Googlebot desktop, and why, um, since desktop doesn't have this the Chrome user agent, why is desktop actually rendering, right? So um, I looked at the requests, and what happens oftentimes is that you see, for example, when you, when you run something to search console, through Search Console and with the um, Inspect URL tool, it's going to always be hit twice, right? So you always have desktop and um, smartphone, or at least like almost always. Um, and in this case, so my first assumption was, OK, because if you look at the timestamps, I was like, maybe what happens is um, they just show the first hit, so the desktop, that being desktop in this case. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe, even though that wouldn't have made any sense, like maybe they're somewhat joining the directives, right? So if the desktop is there and the smartphone and then there's a no-index phone being rendered, then they're somewhat joining it. So I asked John um, Mueller on Twitter. He was like, nah, this is not the case. Um, turns out I was just a bit blind um, because I didn't scroll further in my um, crawl tracking. So basically, what you need to keep in mind, and thankfully now the documentation has also been updated, that happened uh, just a couple of weeks ago, only because it does say Googlebot Desktop, that does not mean that it's not rendering, right? So Googlebot Desktop renders, smartphone also renders. Keep that in mind. It's, it's a bit confusing, um, sometimes at least. And what we, all, what we now also have um, is the, the blue section, so the Chrome um, with the version number. and. Um, there has been a lot of confusion and things that happened in the past because the user agent was somewhat frozen uh, to a Chrome uh, 41. Ever since with uh, Chrome 78, they are now also filling the user agent string with the proper version number, so that makes things a bit easier. Um, and now, uh, at least currently, they are rendering, uh, the Evergreen bot is rendering with the Chrome 79. Um, I think we just got Chrome 80 on the desktop uh, a couple of days ago. Rendering is still 79. The more interesting part is that there is already some experimental, um, and I guess that makes total sense that Google is testing things as well. We've seen a lot of, well, not a lot, but a bit of crawling with uh, Chrome 81. And the reason why I point this out, I think, is quite, um, it's a quite an interesting thing that I feel a lot of people have missed. So there was this announcement in October uh, last year already where Google said, well, in Chrome 81, um, we will be, or the, the Chrome team, sorry, we will be changing uh, a couple of things. And what, basically what happens in a nutshell is, if you're running on a secured connection site, so on, like an HTTPS site, which you all should be by now, I suppose, um, the behavior will change for elements that will be loaded from a certain, from, 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 the behavior will change for elements that will be loaded into the site that come from a non-secured connection. So essentially, if you're trying to load images, um, or CSS, or JavaScript for that matter, that come from HTTP, um, they will try to auto-upgrade this connection to HTTPS, which makes sense. But if that fails, um, they will block the elements. So they're not coming into the site anymore. And I did a quick test. Um, so I basically randomly took 500 big domains according to similar web, um, and I just crawled 10,000 URLs. Yeah, exactly. Um, that was really shocking, and um, it's true for a lot of other, Euro other European countries as well. I did this example for um, uh, like another three or four. Um, roughly half of the sites somewhat still load non-secure elements um, somewhere in their kind of domains. And if you think about that, um, this is content that you might potentially lose in the future. So if you do one thing today or tomorrow or whenever you're back in the office, um, I would suggest you go back, recrawl your sites, and run the reports, whatever crawler you're using. Kasper mentioned a whole bunch of them earlier. Um, and try to see if you're still loading anything that's not coming from a secured connection. And please pay also attention to third-party stuff, not only like the stuff that you're hosting yourself, but also um, third-party contents. All right. So um, the next thing that I looked at, because that's a question we get basically asked all the time um, when we do any kind of consulting work. So we have this we have this situation where a client has you know some content is visible, and then there is a button or a link or whatever, and it says read more. And then what happens is that the page kind of is being expanded, right? So you see 
um, you see more content. So this is the functionality, right? Um, you have the show more button, you press, it expands, and then there's, there's more content being shown. And you can do that, obviously, um, in various different ways. You can do that with pure CSS, you can do that with um, JavaScript, you can do that with ready-made plugins for jQuery and whatnot. There's a whole bunch of different uh, ways to do it. So if you test this behavior, um, what you would see, so the first, on the, on the left-hand side, you would see a screen, uh, a phrase taken from content that's straight visible before pressing the read more button, right? What you see in the SERP preview in the snippet is that you get the highlighting. On the right-hand side, if you compare it, um, that's content taken from the block that is only there when you press um, the expand or the read more button. So what you lose is this, this snippet preview, right? Um, and that's a bit of a shame. So I was like, well, I don't want that. <laughs> I, want the, I want the attention in the search results, so why would I want to lose my, my highlighting on the right-hand side? Um, there is one way to do it. So I tested a whole bunch of different CSS annotations, and I don't know why the screen looks so strange, but anyways. Um, what you can do, so if you rely on this read more, make sure that you're using CSS and that you use overflow hidden. That's the only way, as you can see on the right-hand side, the highlighting is, uh, is still there um, behind the arrow, <laughs> sadly, but the not particular blah blah. This is the preview, so there's the highlighting still there. This is the only way to do it. That still works. Um, you can do it with JavaScript as well. Um, so libraries for jQuery, like readmore.js, they also rely on this overflow hidden. Um, so as long as that's the case, fair enough. If you're using something else, you're potentially losing out on a bit of an advantage in the search results. I would probably change that. Um, yeah, iframes. Um, that's also a very interesting case, I have to say. Um, and I was talking to a couple of people um, about this entire situation before, and everyone was like, mm, iframes, why? They, they, they're not even a thing anymore. I was like, yeah, could be true. But then if you look at the statistics, there's a whole bunch of iframes out there still. Um, and I became curious. But to, to, to quickly kind of revisit what we have, right? iframes, for those of you who don't know or like, probably not relying on them any, anymore because you find them boring, and I agree, they are pretty boring, but maybe not afterwards. Um, anyway, so you have, this, you have this parent page, the, um, the, the yellow one, um, and then you have the, the iframe content, so the, the red one, right? And basically, the, the, the parent page is empty. There's nothing in there. Um, and then you have um, the, the content that you see in the middle comes from this uh, separate second URL. Relatively straightforward, right? The funny thing is, that it seems that iframes, um, when Google started rendering, um, are being treated differently nowadays. So what happens is that you can rank, or that the parent page can rank for the content that's actually only residing in the iframe. And that's quite interesting, because I think some of you have been using iframes in the past very differently, because you have them used kind of isolated in a way, like, okay, I'm going to be taking, I don't know, comments from someone else, but I don't want to rank for them. Um, fair enough, that worked. But um, what you see there on the left-hand side, so the, this, this preview, the snippet in the search results, um, that's actually the content that comes from the iframe. Um, and on the right-hand side, you would see, um, that's taken from Search Console, the, the HTML, um, they basically kind of, the, the iframe tag gets a comment, and then they take all the, they pull all the content um, into the main page, so it will be flattened into one HTML DOM tree. Um, so that's quite interesting, I think. Um, so post-render, the parent page can basically be found um, for the content that's only um, residing within the iframe, which means that brings in a whole different discussion around page level quality, right? So if you're now assessing a domain or, um, yeah, like just a section of a domain, and you have potentially, or you had potentially, kind of algorithmic impacts beforehand, maybe iframes are something that um, you now need to revisit again. The reason why I brought this up is I had a, <laughs> I had a client that I couldn't figure out for uh, my life why they all of a sudden were starting to rank for some very questionable um, phrases uh, and content they would never have served before in the first place. So what happened is they were um, iframing in content from a third party domain. That domain um, got hacked or they got injected with some very nasty, uh, let's say, content, and they started to rank for this as well. So this is the problem, right? Um, so yeah, let's not go down that route because that can be really, really <laughs> problematic. Um, I did a follow-up test because I couldn't really understand it. I couldn't really believe it. Um, 
And there's still links, right? I mean, no one is doing links, I understand, um, but there's still this problem with links as well. So the test that I set up is basically essentially the same um, with a new iframe, and the iframe also has like ex an external and an internal link to it. Um, so one is linking internally within the test project, and the other one is basically pointing to my personal block. Uh, and again, as you would have imagined, this is again taken from Search Console, right-hand side. The, the links that I added to the iframe are being taken and flattened to the parent page, right? So the internal linked URL ranks for its content, so that's not surprising. They use the link for discovery, fair enough. What is really interesting, and that was kind of all the proof that I wanted is, if I look into the Search Console report for my personal website, I see the parent page um, as the referrer. So basically, I think that proves that it will be flattened up into the one parent page and they're counting that as one URL. Um, I found that super interesting because that definitely has not been the case before. What can you do? Um, how can you um, prevent it? How can you protect yourself? I think there's uh, a couple of ways. Obviously, if the iframe itself is being no indexed or robots texted, then it will not be flattened into the main, uh, into the main or into the parent page. So that's one thing. Um, hidden frames won't be indexed either. Um, that works as well, but they can be relatively small. So <laughs> that's might, that might be something to keep in mind. And then there's um, X frames option headers, right? So if you want to prevent your content being framed into someone else's, um, then that's something that you could also use. And then again, a whole bunch of follow-ups if you like. All right, next one up, um, long form contents. So um, one of the things that um, I come across frequently, and I think it's really strange, but nevertheless, uh, if you recall this, this is very old. It was, I think, 2017. Someone did this uh, test um, of how much pixels fit into GSC. Ever since, we had a whole bunch of redesigns and, and whatnot. Um, the 10,000 pixel screenshot preview is still true for desktop. For smartphone, it's 1,700 something. However, I think this is all not really relevant because the screenshot is just a preview, so you should not really rely on this screenshot very much. I mean, it might give you a very, very, very first glimpse, but that's probably all there is. Um, the test that I did, just to prove that quickly, is if you build, like, um, in this case, a diff container, 15,000 pixels height, you would see that on the left-hand side, um, and then you add content below, um, that obviously is not in the screenshot, right? Um, but still, no surprise there, that page is ranking um, also for the content that's below the 15,000 pixel. So I think uh, it just proves that own, uh, the people saying that if something is not in the preview screenshot, uh, it can't rank for this is just entirely wrong. Um, it doesn't really matter. There's no such thing as too long um, in that case. And one thing that's highly underrated, and I think this is probably way more interesting uh, than this uh, preview, is the more info tab in Search Console. Um, because it's somewhat is essentially the same as what you have in your like uh, Chrome browser and the console, and this gives you a whole bunch of debugging info, especially if you have um, potentially trouble with you know JavaScript debugging or any strange exceptions that are being thrown. So this is highly uh, recommended to make use of. I think this is really um, a very powerful tool, actually. All right, um, the next thing I want to quickly talk about is uh, CSS selectors. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept, but potentially, uh, but basically the, the way it works, and I probably do it not on this screen, but on this screen, is that you have you can have content that lives in CSS, and then obviously you have content that lives um, in HTML, right? Um, for from a user perspective, that doesn't really make much of a difference. For from a user's perspective, if you open it in a browser, um, it's it's one page, and the first block, the red one comes from the CSS, and the um, lower section comes out of the HTML, right? So if you test this, um, similar to what I've been doing before, if we start on the right-hand side, no surprise there, that content is in HTML, and obviously um, that page is being found for the content, right? If you turn it around and look on the left-hand side, what you see is if you take content that lives only in the CSS selector, that page is not being found. Right? So that means essentially Google is not indexing uh, the content, and that's fair enough, right? And they're not indexing the content that only lives in the CSS. And it doesn't really matter if the CSS is inlined, so if it's uh, in the HTML document, but it could also be an external CSS. Either way, it doesn't make much of a difference. So why should you care? Um, that could be content 
that you are repeating on thousands and thousands and thousands of pages, potentially shipping info, um, legal info, all of this non nonsense that you <laughs> would need because otherwise your legal department is giving you uh, hell. But uh, from an SEO perspective, it's somewhat a boiler. Um, it's repetitive content that you don't want um, that poten potentially is lowering um, your content quality score. So that would be something that you could potentially solve using CSS um, and using CSS selectors. So that might allow you to create a bit of a different content footprint um, from rather than like, I mean, now we'd probably be using an image or something, which is not as nice. It doesn't scale as nice. So that'd be uh, a good alternative, I think. Redirects. So um, it's going to be a quick one just on a side note because I found it quite interesting and quite funny. Um, just a quick reca recap on re redirect chains in very general. I think redirect chains, for those of you who don't know, redirecting from page A to page B and B goes to C. Um, you don't want that in the first place. Uh, at least in an ideal world, you always want to redirect from the source to the destination. Uh, no hops in the middle. I think I'm not telling you anything new on this one. Um, sometimes there's no way around it. Um, in Search Console, just on the quick recap, recap as well, if you have a redirect chain, they will be sh or a redirect in general, they will be showing you the uh, content from the destination, right? So if you have a source that redirects to some uh, other destination, what you get in Search Console is the output from the from the destination destination page. Um, that's important. And what also happens is if, you, um, if your chains are too long, that means more than five hops, um, they will skip it. What you get is you get um, a redirect error um, and they're not processing it further. So this is fair enough and this is all also somewhat in, in sync with what um, Google is communicating um, in the outside world. Um, what I found quite interesting though is this is not true for JavaScript um, for whatever reason. So I had a client that had uh, 11 JavaScript redirects in a row. Don't ask me why, um, but they had, sadly. Uh, those do exist. <laughs> and then I was saying, like, guys, this is never going to work. And then they were like, but it works. I was like, this can't work. And they were like, mm, but it, the page is even indexed. I was like, are you kidding me? Um, so I rebuilt the test with this. And sadly, yes, it's true. Um, they even follow this chain, and then they index it. I have no idea why. Um, just keep in mind when someone says, my, reader, my JavaScript redirects, they do seem to work. Right now, they do. Um, by the way, not longer than 25, then... <laughs> things fall apart for, for whatever reason. All right, um, last thing for the day. Who is using the jobs indexing API right now? Three, four. Um, I'm sure we're increasing the frequency today. Um, it's an awesome tool, really cool. So um, when, you, when they have been releasing the API, and I believe it was sometime last year, um, I can't even recall when, um, there's, so this is from the, from the indexing API release post. Um, and there's one interesting part that says, the indexing API can only be used for job posting pages that include job posting structured data. That's what it says. So this, basically schema.org uh, job posting. So some kind of um, structured data format, format that you would need to have on your URL or URLs that you want to submit through the indexing API. So I was like, yeah, schema. Let's see how that goes. Um, so this is my test page um, that I built. There's no schema markup on the page. Um, there's nothing that's being injected afterwards. So it's a plain vanilla uh, HTML document, basically. Uh, I have to say, please uh, be mindful of what you do. Please do not blame me. Um, you might potentially be violating the guidelines. Potentially, Google doesn't care. Either way, um, up to you. So what I built, uh, I was late. Um, I was bored. Um, so I built this tool that um, allowed me to send URLs to uh, the Jobs API. And the Jobs API URLs looked exactly what I just showed you earlier, so no schema markup. Um, that was at 10 p.m. 52, and then you send them, and that's like two minutes later, um, they crawl them, so that's relatively straightforward, so there's no validation going on there. Um, then you could argue, well, you know what, um, crawling is great, but I want them to be indexed, that's fair enough, but that also works, so like if you double check relatively quickly after with Search Console, um, they also end up being indexed, so that seems to work quite fine. For those of you who had your hands up, you know that there's uh, a, a limit uh, to the API, at least by default. Um, it says that you can only do like 200 um, kind of actions um, or requests per day. Well, there's also this form that you can fill out. 
Um, you can be very creative by filling it out. Um, I'm not sure who is actually reviewing it, but four out of five times with very funny descriptions, it went through. Um, I ended up with 120,000 API requests. Um, so yeah, I guess it's, uh, there's right now no limit to, well, no limit in the sense of it's not limited to schema.org markup. So you can use it. The reason why I used it, just to give you a bit of context, I had this client that had a very, 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 very old setup. And it was impossible for them to generate proper XML sitemaps because, you know, it's sometimes very hard to get a million URLs generated on a, um, on a, well, in a decent period of time, let's put it that way. But what, what was possible for us was to get single URLs out of the system. So what we basically, is, what we basically did is we took the single URLs and sub submitted them whenever they became available, and we just pinged the API, and that seems to be working quite fine. Um, there's the same thing with way um, lesser restrictions over at Bing. They seem to be doing a quite good job, so you're not only doing this um, for Google, and they even like allow you to increase limits um, going further. However, frankly speaking, I also think um, if you have seen this tweet from Gary uh, over at Google, potentially they might not even care that much about the fact that you're not using um, jobs markup to submit URLs. Um, all I'm saying, I think it's a good tool in the arsenal. It's, uh, if you use it mindfully, um, I think it can definitely help um, if there's no way around it or if you can't do XML sitemaps for whatever reason. And I think with that, I am pretty much done for today. Thank you very much.